Hello, everyone. Um, very strange situation that we all find ourselves in. Um, not really sure whether we're largely talking to ourselves or to other people. Um, I, and I look forward to the day that we may um, be uh, in person again uh, to talk about this, this project. So uh, I'm going to lead off on uh, talking about working group three, which is focused on governance and policy. Uh, and then uh, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of the subprojects, uh, and then Jackie will uh, will uh, pipe in on the, the rest of them. So if we just advance to the next slide, basically, obviously, this is uh, working group three in review. Just to just as a reminder of what the uh, various subprojects are, um, uh, the inventory of tools uh, and best practices with Amy and Jean Piero. Uh, the focus on empowerment um, of marginalized communities uh, with Karin, um, focus on evaluation uh, of uh, AI and its use in, uh, in justice with Arold, uh, number 13, ethical and socio-political issues, which will be led by Jackie, or is being led by Jackie, uh, subproject 14, um, already referred to, led by Pierre Luke on harvesting justice system data, Subproject 15, which is fo focuses on various issues relating to security with Benoit. And subproject 16, um, which will start at the end, um, a roadmap for digital transformation, uh, where Florian will try to expertly bring together um, the insights, uh, not just from our working group, but from throughout uh, the project. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'll take a look at subproject. Uh, uh, let me, uh, sorry, let me tell you a bit about the annual meeting. So we did have a meeting for the working group plan for March 2020 at the University of Ottawa. We had a wonderful guest speaker lined up, Cynthia Koo, uh, on the topic of if an algorithm falls on human rights, but no one coded it, does the legal harm really happen? Um, that was to be followed by individual sub. Uh, project meetings and attending We Robot, which was also to be hosted in uh, in Ottawa in 2020. Unfortunately, all of that wound up being cancelled due to COVID-19, uh, and so, like the rest of you, we wound up just uh, holding subproject meetings uh, via Zoom later. And we'll be talking later today about um, trying to organize a workshop for uh, next year. So, next slide, please. So project 10, inventory of best uh, of policies and uh, best practices of automation. Um, this will be, as Karim noted, uh, wrapping up this year. Uh, Amy, Jean Piero, Florian, and uh, Rika are, are working as the researchers on this topic. We have a number of uh, terrific partners that you can see uh, lined up there, um, including um, academic uh, community organizations and, uh, and policymakers, as well as uh, corporations. Uh, on the next slide, we'll see um, what's happened over the last uh, year. Uh, there's a typology of legal tech tools uh, using AI and automation that is expected to be complete this fall. Uh, an inventory of best practices um, for relating to uh, legal tech, uh, again, ready for the fall. And we're in progress of um, an inventory and content analysis of AI ethics frameworks uh, that's being spearheaded by uh, Jean Piero uh, in association with uh, Matteo, um, a student that he's working with. Um, they have uh, already um, done an inventory of framework documents disciplining AI in several contexts. So they've got about 115 of those. They're conducting a content analysis. So the documents have all been coded and about 80% reviewed. Uh, they're using NVivo software. Um, and uh, there's an analysis of results um, crossing data on ethical implications of AI coded in framework documents and types of documents that is intended to be ready for the fall of, of 2020. Uh, so for SP11, which is the, the next slide, uh, sorry, SP10 publications, um, I'll just let you take a look at that. There are, there are three there. 
um, one from Rika, one from Jean Piero, and another from uh, Amy, co authored with uh, Jenna McGill, uh, another professor at the University of Ottawa. Um, so SP 11, um, Empowering Marginalized Peoples, uh, Karin, um, Jackie, Amy, Pierre Luc, uh, and myself um, all expressing interest in this, um, but get in um, with that, together with Alexandra having, as you'll see, done the, uh, the, all of the work um, thus far. Again, a number of partners from, um, from a series of uh, different um, sectors, which is uh, really uh, helpful. Uh, and then if we go to the next slide, we see the year in review um, so uh, Karin, together with uh, Alexandra, has conducted a worldwide inventory of examples on how members of marginalized communities use technology to seek justice, with justice framed very broadly. Um, the idea was to, amongst other things, look at um, what the group's rationales were for using AI and uh, tech. Um, they collected data about groups' governance models, so who their partners were, for example. Um, and they found that the type of technology used um, was much less important than data justice and control over justice uh, over data. Um, so that was the sort of major theme um, in, the, in the work. And if we go to the next slide, um, we see uh, uh, their publications um, and also uh, two terrific uh, conferences, one intended for the UK and the other intended for Costa Rica that of course did not uh, happen due to COVID-19. Uh, and then, so I'll turn then to subproject uh, 11's planned activities. Um, uh, for the upcoming year, they'll be selecting up to five case studies from their inventory and uh, aim to conduct interviews um, to focus more on understanding reasons for tech use, governance models, and uh, any suggestions or recommendations that folks uh, that they interview um, would have for us in thinking about how uh, AI and tech can be used to achieve justice. Um, ultimate, one of their ultimate goals will be to produce guidelines and best practices for working with marginalized groups and communities. Um, next slide, please. Um, Subproject 12, um, which is just getting started this year on evaluation and key performance indicators, um, headed by uh, Arold um, and including Gilbert, Dominique, Mark, Leslie, Marco, uh, Leslie, Vincent, uh, Jean Piero, and uh, Riyad, um, together with uh, a number of um, uh, groups, um, and especially uh, helped out by um, members of the uh, organizations in the justice sector um, itself. Uh, so, uh, as you'll see on the next slide, the, uh, the this is because this project is just starting this year. We have planned activities, and the idea is to um, prepare an inventory of frameworks for evaluation that are used in the AI sector and evaluation um, used in the justice sector. So to have a, um, a sort of a comparative um, body of, of works on evaluation with the uh, ultimate objective of propo proposing an evaluation framework uh, for use of AI in the justice sector, so that would uh, marry um, the best of the insights in, in both of these uh, areas. Uh, there's a planned event uh, for this uh, December uh, Cyber Justice Conference in Europe um, that is likely to be held virtually, but like everyone else, we, we, uh, we await news. Uh, and so if we advance to the next slide and I'll, I'll sign off and uh, leave it to Jackie to talk about the, uh, the outcomes for the next groups. Great. <clears throat> so, oh, that's odd. I'm hearing myself. Um, thanks so much, uh, Jane, and thanks, Maria, for doing the slides. So SP13 is looking at ethical and sociopolitical issues. Uh, we've got uh, researchers, a number of researchers involved, myself, Jane, Primavera, Paul, Alexi, Marco, Serge, Mireille. Jean, Rika, and Amy, and Riyad. Uh, we also have a number of partners, including a new partner, Deep Law for Tech. We're quite uh, excited about 
that. Uh, can you um, advance the slide for me? Okay. So we welcomed one new researcher this year, Jean Lasseg, and we welcomed uh, one new partner, Deep Law for Tech, uh, Maria Teller. And if you can advance the slide. Uh, presentations under this project, which is one of the areas that we've been focusing on, is explainable AI. Uh, Jane Bailey and I gave a presentation at the Faculty of Law at Trobe University on the issue of explanation. It's interesting to me that our um, various subprojects are, in some ways, uh, convening on on um, on our various projects on a number of critical and, and focal issues. Ex explanation in the context of AI is really obviously one of them. Uh, Jane and I were looking at the notion that judicial decisions could provide a model, and indeed, I think we believe should provide a model for explanation of AI decisions in the context of the justice system. Uh, I have also done some work on algorithmic bias presented at the uh, special, the Law Society of Ontario special lecture series. Uh, looking at the um, sources of algorithmic bias and really discussing the reality, which I think is so evident now with the Black Lives Matter movement and discussion of systemic bias, that algorithmic bias in some cases arises from technical factors, but quite frankly, often arises from the data, not just the choice of the data that we're using, but actually the fact that the data necessarily um, include and encompass and uh, realize systemic bias. Next slide. <clears throat> so what we've also been working on the scoping review and that will be completed, uh, we hope in fall 2020. Uh, we are planning to do a survey and we're going to turn to our partners and researchers in the ACT project as experts to look at what we name and identify as the ethical issues uh, facing uh, the implementation of AI in the justice system. Myself, Jane, Jean Pierre, and Marina Teller will be working on that. Uh, Rika is uh, looking at human oversight in AI decision making. <clears throat> so, exploring the necessary involvement and the ways in which uh, human beings are going to be necessarily involved as AI becomes more integrated into the justice system. And Jane and I are pursuing the um, explanation in the justice system project. Next slide. SP14 is looking at harvesting, just, harvesting justice system data, privacy and open data. That's led by Pierre Luc uh, with a number of researchers and partners as listed here. So in the current year, uh, this group and uh, welcomed two new members, Gloria and Ignacio. Uh, they presented at the Cyber Justice Lab conference on les données judiciaires et l'intelligence artificielle and presented also the work of the subgroup and um, the ACT project in general, I believe, to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. They've applied for a grant related to uh, the privacy of online court documents with, to the observer. Observatoire International, oh no, to the CAI, I think. Anyway, the results of that grant application are not yet out, but we're expecting them soon. Next slide. And for the planned activities, they're planning to conduct uh, online the three face-to-face -face workshops that were scheduled for May and June 2020. I'm so, sure so many of us will have that kind of plan. Projects that will be uh, ongoing in the next year include the privacy and online publication of court documents with the MJQ and the CAI. The plan is to pursue grant funding through SHRC if the OVIA grant is not successful. Another project is looking at the intelligibility of dockets. And a third area is IP issues arising from the online publication of court documents, the creation of online educational materials and creation of a written report. Next slide. SP15, under the leadership of Benoit, is looking at security issues stemming from AI tools. Next slide. Uh, this publication, uh, there were, sorry, this project resulted in two publications, actually three publications this year, a uh, posting in the conversation, which is a great uh, focal piece for us, and also a very important, oh, backwards, Thank you. An important report on artificial intelligence in the context of crime and criminal justice for the International Center for Comparative Criminology. 
and uh, Nicolas and presented a report on la sécurité des actes notaries dématérialisés. Uh, there were also a number of presentations. They're also listed here related to uh, tech and uh, security. And uh, yeah, a lot of activity there. Okay, next. Planned activities are a literature review of the risks associated with AI and judging, uh, accidental security incidents arising from the use of AI and judgment, the hacking of AI, the use of AI to manipulate humans. And again, there you see that interesting overlap with work that be, is being done elsewhere. And an interview with justice system respondents on security issues related to AI in the justice system. And next slide. The final project or subproject under this working group is SP16, which will start in 2012. Florian is leading that, uh, the roadmap for digital transformation. And I think that's the end. Thank you. So thank you, Jane and Jackie. Attendez, I see that there's a question from uh, Valentin about yeah. uh, do you encounter or foresee any new particular challenges associated with the growing adoption of cloud computing by the Canadian Public Administration in particular when it comes to court documents? I think that um, Pierre-Luc and Benoit, you'd be well positioned to answer that, but I can say in the first instance, absolutely cloud computing raises all kinds of privacy and security issues. Ones that we face in the justice system not only in the justice system, maybe in particular ways in the justice system, but I think we're just beginning to um, to take account of those. Pierre-Luc, did you want to say something in relation to that? Or Benoit? Well, maybe I may uh, check in. Sure. Okay, so because this is a quite um, a common phenomena at the moment, uh, so the cybersecurity and data safety of uh, cloud services and uh, um, communication, so in uh, Europe, um, new regulations are being um, uh, de developed by the European Commission. Uh, in uh, collaboration with the member states and the authorities that are responsible for monitoring and enforcing um, uh, these uh, cybersecurity standards. Um, so uh, a lot is going on, particularly on the, on the regulatory part of it. Um, uh, some regulation is already installed for some domains, uh, but this will certainly also cover um, um, legal services uh, uh, by the courts. Um, so the um, regulations as they're currently developing include um, criteria, common criteria, um, also certification procedures for the communication protocols and the algorithms that are being used, uh, as well as uh, guidelines for, for auditing and auditors that have a, and uh, public authorities that have a role in uh, securing um, cybersecurity and data safety of these infrastructures. Um, so what I think would be needed is to bridge between um, the Canadian and the US efforts uh, with respect to this topic uh, to the European developments. Um, um, my image is that the Europe, Europe is a bit um, uh, further in the development, uh, well, similar to uh, the developments of ethical norms and the uh, privacy norms as they have been uh, uh, worked out in the GDPR, for instance. Uh, so it might be useful to to connect um, people from Canada to the European developments. And um, I, I was going to add that uh, yes, absolutely, the cloud is create. So that's Benoit Dupont here. Uh, the cloud is creating major major issues in terms of uh, third party risk that uh, no one really understands uh, properly, and it's uh, also introducing uh, regulatory complexity because the providers of those uh, services are not necessarily regulated under the same umbrella as the uh, you know the uh, authority or the organization to which they are providing services and it's creating a lot of uh, um, headaches for lots of people so we're going to try to um, to understand and, and to see how it's connected with data residing in very uh, 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 sometimes uh, hard to understand places and how it's interacting with mm -hmm. uh, AI uh, people and institutions. It's interesting how the same issues keep on circling around and around again, right? Because we have jurisdictional issues in the context of not just not the cloud, but certainly online. And I don't know how substantively different they are. Have been a, we've been talking about those for a very long time, and we haven't got a solution yet. 
So it's uh, yes. May 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 I uh, step in very quickly just to point out that if you click on your Zoom button uh, at the top of your screen, you'll see that we're all connected via data centers in the United States. Of course, and therefore subject to um, subject to Patriot Act access, right? Although, Although I, I, actually, your that was that, that uh, license... was a sunset clause uh, in the Patriot Act. So the the, the was it? Yeah, the, the most problematic disposition of the Patriot Act, Section 415, is no longer in effect. Thank you for that. Uh, that being said, it was replaced uh, uh, by the Cloud Act uh, two years ago. Uh, this is Nicholas, by the way. Um, just to, to point out on that topic, I've been working with the, uh, the Quebec government for the last now 10 years working on their uh, cloud policies, and I've written a, a number of studies on the topic. And so with one of my students, I'm working I'm hoping over the summer to transform all those studies into a book. So the, the whole issue, as I, I mentioned in the conversation, the whole issue of uh, security of cloud computing, hopefully uh, by the end of this year, I should have a, a book on it. Great. So I'm Hannes. Um, you, you mentioned that um, under subproject 10, there has been some annotation work done on uh, cases using NVIDIA. So I'd be very interested in what kind of annotation that is and also how um, you found the use of the NVIDIA software. I would, uh, I think we should turn that over to Jean Pierrot because he's the person who has been uh, together, uh, he's the person that's been uh, working on using that, so that software. So uh, maybe we can unmute uh, Jean Pierrot, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Jane. Actually, maybe there's a mistake or mis misinterpretation because it's not, we are using uh, uh, the Atlas software, you know, which is, uh, I think, quite different. And um, I have to say that it's very useful for our purpose, uh, that is coding manually uh, the document and assigning uh, a code on the basis of uh, which principle uh, is uh, suggested by uh, a sentence in the framework document. Then we will collect uh, uh, these codes uh, in a quantitative way in order, in order to uh, provide you with some quantitative analysis on how, uh, let's say, the support on principle by these framework documents are distributed around the framework uh, document. Uh, by the way, yes, I, I don't want to make any kind of uh, support for our software, but I have to say that uh, it's been, uh, good to use it and useful for us. So I cannot say anything uh, negative about it. Thank you. 